Absolutely, absolutely. Still in Basel, still all good. Mm -hmm. So we start recording now the session and the soon the people will come in. Okay. And then I start the moderation and, and you can take it from there. Sounds good. That's good. So here we go. So it shouldn't take more than a moment. Here they come. Mm -hmm. So the audience is filling up and I'm ready to kick off the last session of Experience 2021. And it's a great honor and pleasure to see my friend Aegis Hussein here uh, live uh, with me. Um, Aegis is an ex-president of the National Institute for Pharmaceutical Technology and Education. He's also board member of Valgenis. And what I just found out on LinkedIn, he's <laughs> His new title is Practitioner of Life in Science and Creativity. So I wonder if we have some minutes to talk about that one as well. And of course, as a former FDA um, staff, huge experience in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, also on excipients. I follow you on LinkedIn, of course, and it's a great pleasure and honor to have you here. Um, I do a quick announcement concerning what happens after your speech because we have planned a panel. Unfortunately, Dave Schoenecker had to move out because of some personal reasons. Wish him best of luck for everything. And uh, But I'm sure Ages and myself will have a good round of discussion. And I just kindly ask the audience, of course, as well, to jump in with questions and the like. But now, enough from me, because you heard me already the whole day long. Much more interesting and important is what H.S. Hussein has to tell us. Looking forward to your speech, and the floor is yours, H.S. Thank you, Philip. Well, Experience, I think, uh, was the title of this conference, and I could not leave. This was too tempting for me to leave that aside. So I want to focus on experience and ask the question to the audience, what space will excipients occupy in our consciousness in the next decade? Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. And I'm so thrilled to be able to connect with you in these uh, precarious times and uh, talk about uh, our common interest and common and create a com common sense on excipients. So <clears throat> what I would like to do is, um, uh, I just uh, essentially retired from the National Institute for Pharmaceutical Technology and Education and to refocus my attention on my private practice. And um, much of my discussion is based on three papers, which are open access. You can download these papers from a AAPS Farm Site Tech. The latest one was published on 4th of March. It's called Pharmaceutical Quality, Team Science and Education. Uh, this is an ed editorial on a theme issue which we edited um, over the last two years. And the other paper, which I think is important, is Pharmaceutical New Prior Knowledge, 21st Century Assurance of Therapeutic Equivalence. And in a sense, that defines some of the case examples that I will be discussing very at a high level in this talk. But you should be able to get more information on those from that paper. Again, open access, you can download the PDF version. And I think sandwiched between the two is a paper we wrote on US academic pharmaceutical science and engineering community must engage to meet the critical national needs. And that gives you a perspective on how the academic community has responded uh, in times of need uh, within the US and uh, and what they're doing next. So that's the background. But I would like to start with uh, the reason I chose experience as a topic, uh, which I think is important now, is uh, I think a year ago, 26th of uh, February to 2020, 
I was speaking uh, with I was with Chris and Brian uh, at the IFPAC meeting and at the, on the topic of excipients. And my talk was a need for a national system for excipient risk mitigation. And it so happened that uh, I didn't realize um, uh, it looks like when I came back from India via Europe, uh, I was ill. Uh, um, I had the, the had the virus. Looks like I never got tested at that time, and then my mother got sick and she passed away. So we have gone through this viral experience in a way I think uh, which which has impacted us uh, deeply, and uh, and I think we want to build it on that basis. So I think where we are today, I think alone together, civil war, same differences, unbiased opinions and hindsight is always 2020 feels all feels oxymoronic today and i think that's the reason why i chose the question what space will excipients occupy in our consciousness in the next decade because like manufacturing like pharmaceutical manufacturing excipients are also essentially a stepchild in the sector and we only think about excipients and manufacturing when they be, when they are on the critical path and I think we are on the critical path again um, here, and I think we can learn from this experience and do something better. So if I, if I put it in the context of uh, uh, the world is looking for a solution to come back, and, uh, and today I think uh, everybody is counting on vaccines as a means to come back. And so, for example, Two, two or three days ago, I think um, this paper was published. Without these lipid shells, there would be no mRNA vaccines for COVID. So, and, and when you look at that, I think uh, the progress, even though it was warp speed, what was on the critical path and what is on the critical path today? Progress was slowed by issues with stability and manufacturing. Again, excipient challenges, formulation challenges, manufacturing challenges. Compared to say manufacturing science, formulation science, uh, the science of uh, biotechnology genomics uh, has advanced. So, so we are now the becoming the rate limiting step again, and we are on the critical path again. And I think this is something that cannot be as we go forward. So <clears throat> again, uh, immediate hypersensitivity to PEG has been in the reports today and uh, confirmed allergic reactions to vaccines are not frequently attributed to active ingredients but rather to excipients. Why? I, I think that's that's a valid question because when you look at all the investigations that are being done on getting to the root cause, I think those investigations uh, don't give you the comfort of that they they are, they are the scientific investigation so i think this is something that still haunts us and still we have room for significant improvement furthermore excipients as adjuvants so very few people realize hydroxypropyl cellulose is an extremely potent adjuvant how how come people don't understand that so i think the notion of excipients in our mind as inactive ingredients, the old historic definition of inactive ingredient has long been, um, uh, should, have been should have discarded that long, long ago, but in our mind, we still have the inactive ingredient and we don't give enough respect to and attention to excipients because of our legacy mindsets and blind spots. So I'll ask the question in the sense now, this is a paper that was published uh, March 8, a couple of days ago in JAMA, uh, which is reporting that um, uh, the occurrence of severe reactions consistent with anaphylaxis is at the rate of 2.47 per 10,000 vac vaccinations. Can you imagine? what that number translates to per billion vaccinations and per billion, multiple billion, because we may be consistently needing vaccines again and again with the variants and mutations. This is mind boggling. Uh, 22.4 per 10,000 is amazingly risky in my mind. Uh, 
and 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 so how do we reconcile the risk benefit ratio and how do we protect the patients and so forth this is we are at the precipice of a very dark place at the moment so in that sense i think um, you know, we have to think about uh, experiential learning um, especially now because in uncertainty uh, the prior knowledge that we have is not going to help us we need to uh, focus on qualia quality and assurance which are all phenomenal uh, phenomena and an emergency is also a, an anxiety prone phenomenon so i think the whole uh, project management model of time cost and quantity uh, and quality being the subjective aspect and assurance being subjective qualia is your consciousness i think uh, we have to think about these things in the context of uh, uh, cost is public funds now time is warp speed and quantities we're talking billions i think this is an unprecedented uh, challenge that we face as a community of knowledge and practice and and therefore my appeal is my focus is more on on how do we provide assurance of quality in the quantity of products that we need to produce this is the key topic in my mind and when and therefore, I chose the uh, uh, question, excipients in our consciousness. And, 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 and to do that, the reason I want to do that is at each level, at each stage, at each person engaged in our, our community of knowledge and practice, we need to prevent errors of omission and errors of commission. So we have to prevent errors at every stage. And without necessarily the safeguards of uh, the typical supervisory sign off and typical thing and without FDA inspections, FDA has not inspected any facility. And yesterday, the Congress, the US Congress reviewed that and was very upset. And and the and so virtual inspections. What is the value of virtual inspections? What is the value of paper-based uh, inspections? So these are topics which are at the core of our profession. We're at the core of every human being at the moment. So the in our consciousness means whether you are industry pharma professional in R and D, regulatory manufacturing, quality or purchasing, from to regulatory agencies to excipient supply system to healthcare, public health patients, uh, providers, payers, and if you're a professor or in, in academia, excipients have, will occupy a significant uh, space in our consciousness is, is a given now. So, so mind-boggling experience is what I want to present to you, talk to you about, uh, because if I talk about uh, uh, how it, what is the level of errors uh, and confidence that we have in the products that we will be making. We used to talk about Six Sigma uh, with respect to uh, 3.4 defects per million opportunities. We have to now talk about per billion opportunities. So what is the uh, what is the likely X, X per billion X is defects, errors of commission or omission or type 1 or type 2 errors or, uh, or essentially adverse events. So the numbers are mind-boggling the challenges is mind-boggling and i think ex excipients play a very central role in all of these challenges so in that sense how do we leverage experience i think is the key so experience with confidence level the symbol epsilon is for with confidence level experience is to feel emotions and as professionals uh, we do that with confidence within the qualified confidence level because of our education, training, and experience. And I think understanding experience, experiential learning, I think, is going to be a very important topic uh, as we go forward. So how do I define experience? Experience is subjective. Experience is personal. Experience is is <clears throat> we talk about experience in professional setting as 10 years of experience, 15 years of experience, 20 years of experience, but that doesn't measure experience. Experience is to feel emotions. So how does one leverage emotions uh, in a professional setting? And, and so in, in this sense, what, I, what I've been trying to do in India, in my training programs in India, for example, is to help uh, the young talent in India uh, prevent, uh, 
making mistakes and so forth. And because we depend on India as a major supplier of medicines, especially affordable medicines. So, so experience in my mind is I'm taking a, a life, not a life cycle approach, a life spiral approach. So if you if you think about two axes, the Y axis being knowledge. So you can go from uh, on the positive side, uh, known knowns to known unknowns to unknown unknowns as a basis for thinking about that axis. And, and deep inside us, uh, unknown knowns, we don't know what we already know sometimes. And the X axis goes from uh, uh, the center point being I, 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 or me, 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 on to family, to our community of knowledge and practice, to our nation, to our world, to the next generation. I think uh, the key then is experience is reflected in our intention, attention, and action uh, that we give, uh, or uh, attention we give and action we take. And if we do that with confidence level, that is certainty is within a given sample qualified confidence interval. Uh, so that we meet the expectations. So I'm essentially bringing the concepts of uh, uh, statistical process control, process validation, quality by design, all those guidelines that we have um, that uh, we use to do quality by design, to validate our processes, methods, and so forth, and essentially merge those with our internal experiential learning so that we can leverage our experiential learning in a professional um, and objective sense, and we don't suppress our emotion, we, we convert our emotions, uh, negative emotions into passion, positive emotions that drive us towards solutions that we need to contribute to the world. That's where I'm coming from. And I think it took a long while for me to think about this uh, in this sense, because uh, I re I had left pharma. I was uh, had moved over to the tobacco sector for making plant-based tobacco vaccines. And which now in Canada, they're making the COVID-19 vaccine in that plant-based system, but also modified risk tobacco products. So then I came back to pharma in 2012. I was not planning to, but I did. And then I had to sort of confront the challenges of uh, uh, non-compliance challenges, um, massive breaches in assurance of data integrity. This was 2012, 13, 14. And, and I then focused on this aspect, education, training, and experience, 21 CFR 211.25. Theory, practice, and epistemology, I think the, the foundation of our regulatory system on the GMP side is education, training, and experience. If I take the U.S. perspective, that is 21 CFR to 11.25. On the other side, on the review side, we have essentially the educational qualifications very loosely defined. So the entire regulatory system depends on education, training, and experience of people who work in the system, yet we have no objective means of measuring and engaging what is the, uh, is the education, training, and experience appropriate across the global supply chain. And so th that's a big weakness in the system. And today, when I put on my regulatory hat, how do I help um, you regulate uh, products coming from 3,000 facilities all over the world with I have no idea what the education, training, and experience is of those people and how do I trust the data that they're going to tell me? So this, these are the fundamental challenges that have come to haunt us today. So in that sense, I think breaking the two to three stigma barrier, I think, which is the way the pharmaceutical um, uh, manufacturing operates uh, uh, is, is a key example. And I, I looked at Amgen as an example, and you have all that information available to go back and look at it. How did Amgen achieve the six sigma, that is 3.4 defects per million opportunity? And one of the things you'll see there is exquisite control on excipient suppliers exquisite control on excipients and, and characterization, benchmarking of measurement uncertainty and so forth and so forth and so forth. And we know how to do this, but we don't do it. And therefore, I think the question in my mind has been for a long time now is we know the solution. We know what to do. We have all the guidelines, but we don't do it. So six blind men, regulatory science, Bob's big idea and Gandhi's way out of hell was... Uh, um, was a thing that I wrote in 2015, goodbye 2015. And I'm building experiential learning depends on how, whether you contemporaneously record your experience because you can't rely on your memory. So, so most of my experiential learning is on LinkedIn. 
and and captured uh, in real time literally and contemporaneously so that we want to think about how do we improve our systems and how do we support ourselves our colleagues our the young generations in the profession to uh, do the right thing not make mistakes and 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 uh, and keep it, it providing the assurance of quality patients need and de deserve and today we all are patients and and if, if we can't learn from appreciating the patient perspective today uh, especially the younger generation uh, when will we ever learn i think that's the point i want to make here so one of the challenges that what i see is the uh, the the legal and the regulatory systems evolve much faster than the science and technology evolves and that's that's the nature of the system we work in it's a socio-technical system and we have to to mature a system of socio-technical system we have to mature our technology and we have to mature our society and society in this case is the professional societies and we are all members we have to mature ourselves so, for example, um, at, at the USP conference in 2015, I think um, I was asked to think about, uh, USP asked me to think about what are the blind alleys or blind spots in the system. And one of the things I had to point out is in 1938, the entire push for the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act that we currently operate under was a failure of excipient. It was diethylene glycol. Uh, and and the elixir sulfonylamide elixir, uh, which which uh, which triggered in uh, the FDNC Act. So if I look at diethylene glycol as an excipient supplier, I think if you look at the Center for Disease Control, oh, um, more recently, if you look at that, over twenty thousand people have we can count twenty thousand deaths so far because of diethylene glycol poisoning all over the world. India, Bangladesh, uh, India, and, and Jaslok Hospital, and 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 then Gurgaon. So there are so many painful cases there. And when did our eyes open to even measure diethylene glycol and glycerin and other aspects? It was 2007. So I had to tell FDA uh, reflect ourselves. It, does it take 70 years for us to open our eyes for something that kills people? Diethylene glycol, when did we start measuring? When, when did it come to Monaga? In 2007. Whereas the, it, the notion of diethylene glycol poisoning was there from 1937. It takes, we are asleep, we are asleep at our jobs. We sleep, we don't take, we, it's not in our consciousness. The excipients are not in our consciousness. And I can point as an ex regulator, cases after cases of people die because of excipients not being, we don't pay attention to excipients. And I think that's the point I want to make here is we cannot keep ignoring the facts as we have been doing. Plus, we, we define our problem too narrowly. Uh, we, we don't even have the right vocabulary. Our grammar with respect to our excipients is completely wrong today. And if I look at the systems we have across Europe and so forth, they should be scrapped and we have to rebuild now. I think uh, everybody's talking about great reset. This is the time for great reset for excipients. And, and uh, if you look at our paper in um, that published a few days ago, um, we pointed out the challenges with excipients with respect to pediatric formulations. It's utter shameful situation that we are in today. Uh, we tolerate the uncertainties even for our children. How can we even look at ourselves in the mirror and say we are professionals? We are not professionals. We are better than, than we are, well, well, what do I say? Anyway, you, you get my point. So excipients, uh, I think the blind spots that we have is if you think about a, a case that happened in, in, in France recently with levothyroxine, people went crazy when they saw lactose out and mannitol and citric acid was put into place. So we are not defining excipients correctly. We are not appreciating excipients correctly. We are not providing uh, the attention for excipients that it, they deserve is, is the point I want to make here. So the point here is, I think if you, if you look at uh, my recording of this, uh, a canary swallowed up by a bioequivalence cat, we focus all the attention on one time bio equal study and, and, and three process validation and we have validated for rest of our life. Wake up, 
I think is the point I want to make here is where are we? Uh, we are the patients. We are the receivers. We have our parents receive our children receive the medicines we make in the way we do that. But attention to excipients is difficult to come by. Yes, at, at, at the National Institute, we have been working diligently to create a knowledge base and excipient management base. But it is such a tiny piece. It's not even a solution yet. Uh, yes, we have an, a, a NIPTI FD and XCP knowledge base, but it, it is hardly usable in, in a commercial setting. There's so much work to be done in, in that regard. And so if I look at learning from, from my business decisions, I think, uh, uh, I, think I was, in some sense, uh, I have been able to see situations uh, where money was never an option. For, for example, the next generation product assessment as a chief scientific officer for Philip Morris, I had no limit on my budget. Three billion, four billion, we spent like crazy to develop those products because we have a rich company. Similarly, biosimilar development at Sandoz, money was never an option. But then I look at, I was, I also uh, looked at the challenge at, at Vocard in India, a small biotech company. So I have seen all sides of it and excipients, uh, is often becomes a critical decision when excipients uh, are on the critical path to an approval process. After approval, nobody cares about excipients. And I think that's, that's an aspect that we want to think about. Similarly, as a regulator, while at FDA, I think uh, um, we, we did a lot of work in, in, as part of the biofarm classification guidance, for example, uh, <clears throat> Subject by formulation interaction was a key term. Manitol and then impact of uh, excipients on bioavailability. So we wrote a paper then was to show that uh, manitol induces more subject by formulation interaction than metoprolol and ranitidine and so forth. So the point here is uh, excipient, uh, attention to excipient and importance of excipient is not understood. So I'll give you one example. Um, one company which doesn't exist today, a major company, it used to be number four company in the world, um, went into failure after failure after failure for dissolution test. And you know what was the reason for that? Because the, the shellac in the sugar coating of that thing, uh, there was a drought in India and the, the composition of shellac uh, uh, changed and they could not figure it out. The company was quiet. It doesn't exist anymore. And I'm the the only reason perhaps I got engaged with excipients early in my career, in my career was um, uh, I had an idea which was funded by uh, Hercules and Equalon to develop computer-aided formulation design with artificial neural networks. So I was trying to develop a prototype for technical service support for Equalon for the hydroxypropyl cellulose, hydroxyethyl cellulose, hydroxy, uh, hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose for control release to predict control release. So that's how my academic career before I went to FDA got started on to create knowledge management system for excipient for practical solutions like and uh, for 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 an excipient supplier. Uh, a technical service support is if, if instead of giving your your customer a, a, a example of a formulation, why don't you help the customer formulate? My PhD was in topical products and it was funded by Gut Fosse. Uh, so I characterized the excipient transcutal. So, so excipients in my case have always been with me at every level of my own development. And, and therefore I have a passion and now where, where we are going is we need to design particles uh, uh, and there is no distinction between, in my mind, drug and excipients anymore. So I think, I think thinking about excipients as inactive ingredients is the worst uh, error we can make. We cannot think about excipients as inactive ingredients anymore. They are functional design critical elements. And we not only have to think differently, but how do we think differently in a commercial setting? And what systems do we need to evolve to support the, the, the supply of excipients for pharmaceuticals, which is a very small market. I think those are the topics that I've been working on for some time now. And I think in Q&A, we probably could pick up on that. So I hope, let me bring this 
point uh, uh, together is experience is a powerful learning mechanism. We don't, in our education and training, we don't learn how to use our experience effectively. We learn that ad hoc. Some, some do extremely well, some don't. Uh, and I think now is the time to think about experiential learning as a key component. Uh, and, and I think um, we have a solid uh, foundation or, or our guidelines that we have for method validation, for process analytical technology, for quality by design, for process validation. The, the principles contained in these guidelines are logical. They are critical uh, thinking. If we can simply bring those principles in our mind, we can actually leverage our experience. That's what, what, what my work has been in some of the training programs I'm developing right now, particularly in India. So, so in that sense, I think I go back to where did this begin for me? Remember the Process Analytical Technology Initiative was formally launched uh, on 16th of November, 2001. Remember a month before that, what happened? It was September 9-11 happened. And we were so more committed to pro proceed with PAT at FDA after 9-11 for what reasons? I think for security reasons, for ensuring supply reasons. But at that time, the Department of Defense held a program which I think was very useful for me what is sense making and this is a picture from from that which i've talked about in some of the papers so you'll have that is how does one go from physical domain to information domain to cognitive domain in a in a organizational management perspective so going from prior knowledge i have inserted new prior knowledge our mental models or paradigms how do we understand how do we make sense and how do we uh, acquire, judge what, uh, what, what is right and wrong? And how do we come up with our intent? Uh, and then intent command leads to planning, directive synchronization to actions. So we go from mind to information domain to physical domain and we make observations and then we come back into this. And so what are the decision support tools? How do, how do emotions, belief and perceptions impact on this? I think is the key of sense making is the key. And my journey to Philip Morris working on tobacco, especially modified risk tobacco in, in living in Switzerland really opened my eyes on this. And I'll come back to that later. But I want to leave this with you. Your beliefs are cause maps that you impose on the world after which you see what you have already imposed. Common sense is not so common. And I think, and, and common sense as uh, Einstein said, is a collection of prejudices acquired by age 18. And I think that's really where I want to go back and, and think about this. So, so in my ex experience, so I'm just reflecting on my own development which has been influenced quite heavily by people such as uh, Deming, Schuert, uh, uh, and, and, and Einstein, obviously, and so forth. So, so I take you back to a, a, a time. Uh, this was uh, uh, in Kyoto, Japan, uh, and I was to sign off on, I was the FDA lead for, for ICH process, so I'm signing off on uh, ICH QH step two. And, and, and this picture was taken and, and, and John Barrage uh, sort of in his presentation acknowledged my contribution as I, I, I hounded them with three words, design space, procrustean and epistemological. So those were my keywords, which uh, came intuitively. And over the past several years, I have been able to put those, that intuition as insights into a framework borrowing from the work of Deming and Schuert, obviously, but also going to the uh, behavioral economics and then constructive development theory of adult human development. And that being that if you take the theory of profound knowledge, Deming talked about theory of knowledge, knowledge of variation. I think we have made progress uh, on that in our guidelines, uh, Q8, Q9, Q10, and so forth. Where we need to pay attention now is appreciation of a system, psychology of change. And the psychology of change is, I'm linking it to adult human development. So what I what I do is plan, do, check, and act what we do in matter, try to bring that into our mind in a way that I think is meaningful. So for example, the case example I have done for Amgen is how to break the two to three sigma barrier like Amgen uh, and, and linked it to 
to their professional development and their maturity of the system. So, so I'm not going to go deep into this, but uh, according to constructive development theory of adult human development by Professor Keegan at Harvard, constructive means we are makers of our meaning. So we are make we make meaning, and and uh, the meaning I make of quality in India and me meaning of quality I make in 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 U.S. is different. The meaning of excipient is different. So I think that's where I'm focused on. So if I take the example, the words from Pfizer, Norm Winskill, and uh, Steve Hammond at FDA Science Board with PAT, they said uh, Pfizer has a policy of don't use, don't tell. And then Amgen had a has a statement which which I, in the reference in 2004 they began their journey to Six Sigma, not the methodology but the 3.4 defects per million opportunity. So they started with the point: if I don't look, there is no problem. And they had to take a start. No, that's not an acceptable stance. Uh, we have to educate everyone to be good problem solvers at their level. And so, so that really lines up quite nicely with Professor Keegan's orders of consciousness. And he calls them, there are five orders of consciousness in, in human development. We start with impulse control. Uh, we, then we become imperialists in our selfish. And then we learn to be socialized. And we then become self-authored, internally validated. We stop seeking external validation. And then the fifth order of consciousness in his is uh, we take a system of systems perspective. And, and I think that really comes on quite nicely with the maturity of quality management system that we need to think about. But the, what holds us back is what he calls immunity to change, the change prevention system, our feeling system. We can't overcome our negative feelings, the fear and knowing system, knowledge management. Change prevention system to a large extent is a regulatory system which uh, type one, type two variation and so forth where change is bad. And, and I worked most of my career on this, improving the SUPAC concept into more continual improvement program. And so that's, that's where I'm coming from here. So in that sense, I think uh, I want to wrap up, uh, not take too much time. So I remember from, uh, having lunch with Felipe on, uh, it was uh, 25th of May, 2012 in Basel. Uh, I was giving a talk. Uh, my talk then was uh, quality by design, the three dimensions of quality by design, chemometrics, pharmacometrics, and econometrics, because uh, coming out of uh, tobacco with uh, Philip Morris, I had behavioral economics aspect of behavioral modification in my mind. But now, eight years later, I'm adding <clears throat> chemometrics, pharmacometrics, and maturity metrics here to think about, think about how we go further. So I'll stop here. Uh, so 2020, we should see more clearly now, uh, change, joys, and principles. We choose our joys and our sorrows long before we experience them. So choose your experience, overcome your immunity to change, change your vocabulary. These are not inactive ingredients. So choose your order of consciousness. Don't be a procrastinian. Control your impulses. Don't be an imperialist. Yes, you're good, you're socialized, but you need to be self-authored at minimum. Internal validation, that's what makes a professional. Let me stop there. Ages. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> and this means something. No, um, such a wonderful and insightful talk. Thank you so much for being with us. This is, I think, a better closing session than what you just gave with this holistic approach. I could not imagine. So I'm very happy. I hope the attendees as well. I see some questions pop up. And then after the questions, I would like to do part of the panel that we plan to get with you and Dave Schoenecker, who can unfortunately okay. not participate. But um, let me start with the question of Sandra Klein. Excipients of natural origin, such as shellac, might be favorable in vulnerable patient groups. Do you think we should stay away from them because of great risk of viability? Or is there a chance to use them in the future when ensuring appropriate communication with the suppliers? No, I, there's no reason to shy away from that. No, I think it, it is it is being aware of uh, the variability and and managing the uh, variation risk management. I think that that's uh, if you're, you're aware of variation, then you can manage that. Say, for example, I think I came from tobacco plant, tobacco extract sector, right? When I was at FDA uh, in 1995, 
uh, Kessler wanted to uh, regulate uh, tobacco, and most of our labs were testing testing uh, uh, tobacco cigarettes. Okay, yeah. FDA labs, were, and we could. We, this was. I'm, I'm not joking. The content uniformity of nicotine is better controlled in, in cigarettes than in, in digoxin in tablets. I'm not joking. And that, and that was, and that was the reason why Kessler went to the Congress that these are drug delivery system. We have to regulate that. Okay. So when Philip Morris called me, he said, "You want, you want to come and work for us?" I said, I, "I'm going to. I need to learn without it." Like, no, it's a natural product. They control it online. They control it with. So there's no issue with natural products in my mind because it can be controlled if you understand in your consciousness that there is variation and I know how to manage the variation. End of story. So it might be more than in the direction of natural products are usually you looked at the cheaper ones than the synthetic polymers and stuff. But what you say is that we really just have to apply stringent controls to Correct. guarantee quality all over and not only batch to batch, but supplier to supplier and improve yeah. monographs on that. No, one, right? it is like this, right? Supplier to supplier, because uh, Philip, Moore, like, I'm just using Philip Morris. Philip Morris doesn't have any farms. They buy tobacco from the market. And it is uh, and analyzing and blending it the right way to make the batch, right? I mean, that's that's how you 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 to do this. So, for example, I think the project I did with Philip Morris was making uh, H5N1 pandemic flu vaccine in tobacco plant. Now the same yeah. platform. If you if you look at what's happening in Canada, that platform is now a multi-million dollar platform rushing to make the COVID vaccine for Canada. I right? wanted to so, ask that one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a natural. Um, uh, you're growing in plant, right? So we have to take about the season, the plant. All those variables have to be factored in. It can be done. Absolutely. So I switch over to Chris Moriton. Um, okay. How does your thought? How is your thought? we need to rethink about excipients and that they are no inactive square with the regulatory ag agency's attitude, for example, FDA inactive ingredient database. So he touches on the point that he said, we should no longer look at the excipients as inactive ingredients. I, If I understand the question correct, how to go along with this in the future? Right. No, so I think, Respect the legacy. I mean, that's how we have evolved. Okay, so where we are right now, and this is this is the most up to date discussion with the regulators is FDA about a month ago launched uh, the pilot program on maturity of a system. So, so system maturity that's what they're measuring. Now, they also signed a memorandum of agreement with National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Okay, and 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 Industry 4.0 is coming. So. The compendial standards are market standards. Okay, so these are market standards for the professional community. When tested, you have to conform to that. Correct. And the materials that we call excipients, not just not just for they're not just for pharmaceuticals. They are for they are for food. They are for vaccines. They are for devices. The nanomaterials are being injected now. So what is the difference between the nano nano devices and the, so that has merged. So there is my way of thinking is that's where I'm pushing the the talking to the Congress and so forth is we need a new system. Now yeah. national yeah. national center for toxicology research is is the basis for qualifying new materials compared to the grass. So I'm essentially working on building a new system which will take it to the next level because we can't change the legacy system anymore. That's, that's, that has a different purpose. That's where, I, that's where my thoughts are. That's the past, right? So yeah. I, I, I come back to one of the topics because of novel acceptance later on. As okay. this, this was a question in the panel I wanted to ask, but I don't want to miss out Alan Guy um, question. What future do you see for artificial intelligence as part of the strategy predicting or managing risk formulation and QBD? Very interesting Alan, and intriguing question. Alan, that's my area of expertise. Most people don't know that. All my research was AI, artificial neural networks for many years, okay? <laughs> what I can tell you is better be creative. Your job will be gone in no time. If you are, if you are algorithmic, if you are process follower, if you follow SOPs, those jobs won't exist in 10 years or maybe less. I'm telling you, the the advancement on AI, what I'm seeing in with my with my with my advisory role and applied and so forth is it's mind-boggling. You don't need people. So 
certain areas people will simply disappear and we will have much more um precision I'm telling you and I'm security you, yeah th th this has not come out yet but but especially with injectable dosage forms and then control of that and predicting prediction of uh, these are mind-boggling applications which people are not, not aware of that's the reason i'm focused on in india i'm trying to help them be more creative because anybody who follows an sop their jobs are gone <laughs> so uh, alan or just mentioned so you recommend i retain <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> um, another great question you mentioned how little we know about excipients now i have a question to the audience and please use the chat because it's something that i realized when i was getting in touch with universities and studies because i'm an economist by background never studied uh, pharmaceuticals and i was astonished how little excipient play a role in the study so audience please type in how much was the part of excipients you really learned at university the ones that that studied pharmacy of course so i wonder if somebody will type in something yesterday the poll worked out pretty well ah okay so <laughs> it already comes it's nothing zero eleven not no, much. I, 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 Philip, I agree. I was lucky because it so happened. Uh, I needed. I was. I was building my research program at University of Cincinnati. I needed funds, right? Yeah. So I had this idea of computer-aided formulation design. So I said, where do I start? Because I went to pharma companies. They said we're not interested. The only company that was interested was excipient manufacturer Hercules or Ecolon. They funded my research. And the reason I was biased towards excipient manufacture because my professor Wolfgang Richel, uh, who was close collaborator with Gattafosse, and Gattafosse had uh, funded my research. That's my connection to excipient, and very few people have that, right? And it's, and it's incredible. I mean, I started 20 years ago in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, you could have asked the question back then. It would have been the same answer. Yeah. Chris, Chris Moriton even... Um, says yeah. all the same so no, no the, the, chris and i share a very similar background we are both pharmacists so i i can completely relate to where he's coming from you know uh, absolutely so um interesting to see that we need to base also more uh, i assume more more knowledge transfer that people get the message how important excipients are and not only by chance of their phd work because they did something within formulation and excipients Right. So the question Peter has was, if excipients are that important, are there then generics for orals, even the formulation? No, I think this is the legacy, right? So I think the, the key aspect with, see, uh, therapeutic equivalence has four components. It is pharmaceutical equivalence, bioequivalence when necessary, the label indications, and the GMP manufacturing. The four parts make a therapeutic equivalence, right? Pharmaceutical equivalence is the old we are old definition that we have we have legacy one right so a tablet is a tablet a capsule is a capsule but a, a caplet which is uh, gelatin coated is what i mean we, we struggle with that so i think we are at a cusp now for example um, one of my companies with that i advise um, and shareholder this is what we did at Novartis. Uh, no when we i was at Novartis, we, we started the continuous manufacturing institute at mit and now, um, yesterday I posted, we have a $69 million facility stood up, continuous manufacturing on the ground right now. Okay, So this is what is happening, I'm telling you. The, the key is um, what we are making continuous manufacturing end-to-end -end APIs manufactured in C2, co-crystallization and comes out. A tablet is a molded tablet. It's not a compressed tablet anymore. All right? And so, yeah. so the whole definitions are changing. So, so given the chaos given where we are the reset is rechanging the definition of pharmaceutical equivalence we are at that stage right now that's what we are working on incredible movements now this this leads me to some of the topics uh, unless there are some more questions i don't think so and um, this leads me to the topic of of one of the p panel questions i mean you told us and uh, also chris and dave told us a little bit what they think or what you think has to change for having first-in-class um, medicine in the future. One, one part is, of course, is the industry ready, but also is the regulatory ready, or by when will we be ready as a system to, to do so? What is your take on this? 
No, look. It, it's 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 not a simple question. It's a very complex question, and and, <laughs> and 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 you can't put everybody in the same. So, for example, so for example, if I look at uh, uh, the timing that we had, I, I was hired by Sandoz to head their biosimilar at a time where there was no regulatory pathway for biosimilars, right? So we had to open the pathway. So I, had to, I went to the Sandoz to sue FDA and sue European Commission and won those lawsuits. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to, the, the, to, to, to Philip Morris and the first modified risk tobacco product application, which is now, and, and Philip Morris has said they're going to stop making convince, is that one. So I had the wonderful opportunity to be at, at, at places where you had to push the envelope, right? So, and, and, and FDA asked me in 2000 after I did the BCS to think visionary and try to change system. So, so I'm, I'm sort of looking ahead and yet, and I'm sort of, and how, how to build that forward is the work that we are doing right now. So old system is not going to go away. Old system will continue and so forth. But what has changed now is that awareness or consciousness about manufacturing is criticality and excipients is now spreading across beyond beyond just uh, that our our profession to everybody is thinking about this right so once that happens things start happening and the way things happen in our socio technical system is the laws have to change correct okay yeah so my work is on the laws that are changing and money is not an option money is flowing right now correct? okay so 400, 400 million dollars for one uh, continuous manufacturing facility in Virginia, another 400 million dollars coming. So money is not an option. And time is warp speed. Uh, now, now we talked also a little bit um, more in detail already about um, criticality of excipients, functionality and stuff like this. Um, the industry needs, assumingly, um, novel excipients. And there we are. Go, touching the topic of um, talks of readiness for use and stuff like this, and and the development of a novel excipient and bringing it to the market is huge money. You say it's not an option, but it's a long time frame as well. How do you see, on the one hand side, um, the aspect from the excipient manufacturers because there are not a lot of novel excipients coming to the market? and how to optimize and let's say the the way of novel excipients coming to the market i don't have all the answers for that philip right now and uh, <laughs> what no, I thought. No. So, but where, where where i am and where i think we the gaps exist that's where i'm working on really is 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 to think about um, uh, i think there's an old legacy mindset that's yeah. our immunity to change. I'm thinking very differently right now. So in my mind, I'm not thinking about old excipient model and all so forth. I'm thinking about say take take an excipient which will go in a vaccine, which will go in in a nanobot that will be injected, will go in in food, will go in this, and how do I bring about an assessment of that uh, from a commercial sense? What are the new systems that are needed? For example, I, I cannot think about USP and FDA being able to handle that at the moment with, with the current systems. So what other uh, things need to come about? So, in, in the, so on the table right now is NCTR, um, National Center for to 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 Toxicological Research, uh, uh, NIST. How do we create additional systems, new systems for this? Because now is the time to do that. If we don't do that now, it will never happen. Okay, v very interesting take. And I, I'm sure, I mean, we don't have the answers yet, but no. um, because what I see is this dilemma in the novel excipients, um, the investment in time and money is so heavy so that we nearly do not have innovation uh from the excipient manufacturers no the, the old the, the, the old old model the old systems will not work for that that's what i'm suggesting the old systems will not work for that so we There's have no to, way. so we have we to have, have new systems yeah we need to and disrupt we, the systems right no 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 no, 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 no disrupt we, we, see, we can't disrupt you build 
for better, right? I mean, that's the the term that everybody's using. Build back better is what the the political phrase is everywhere around the world right now. So yeah. what that what that means is we don't destroy the old system. The old system has got us to this stage. That we do you respect that? You don't you don't poo poo the old system, even though it's not perfect. That's us. That's that has brought us here. How do we do something better now from that? I think that's the attitude we need to have. So I, I believe what you say is um, it's like in a computer program you have version 1.0 and Correct. then you bring in, instead of completely reprogramming everything because you cannot and you don't want um, yeah. build on that experience as well, right? Yeah, right. See, you have to you have to pardon pardon me in this case. And this is where I think uh, Chris and I uh, complement each other. Uh, this since since 2000, right? I was. I was forced and essentially asked by the FDA to think big picture, right? So I, I left labs and, and, and hands-on in 2000. So 20 years, I've been thinking big picture and what comes next. That's what my training is now. So I sort of complement and sort of make complete with, with Chris because he is the nuts and bolts that needs to be done. So we have to, those two come together. It cannot be one or the other. Okay. Very good. So... I think from my point of view, um, thanks a lot again. I think we have answered all the questions. Um, had a very small panel discussion, not really um, at, the, at the level we wanted to have it, uh, but um, I hope this was still good for you, Aegis. I'm a big picture guy. I hope I didn't waste. I, mean, I hope you were able to appreciate the big picture and, and looking forward to aspects. So. Ab absolutely. I think we, in our daily lives, we are digging our heads too much into details. And I no, always. That's, no, don't, don't, don't poo poo that. That's, that's absolutely important. That's necessary. But that's also, that's, that's necessary, but not sufficient, right? You have to look forward to is what I Exactly. Saying. Sometimes you have to step out. To yeah. see the big picture and then dive in again. So I, I'm yeah. fully aligned with you. Don't you worry. So okay. big thanks again for this enlightening talk and discussion, conversation together with you. It was a big pleasure having you and a big honor to have you with us. I'm sure there we might... We should do a lunch in Basel again. So <laughs> Absolutely. Whenever it's possible, we do that. I, You are my guest. So okay. <laughs> you just have to come over and All right. we're going to manage that. So... Um, Thanks a lot again. Thanks to the all the attendees as well and the good interactions. Uh, interaction continues.